Thanks so much. And thanks in particular to the viewers. Thanks to the team who made this happen. What an exciting time. What a fantastic kickoff to a fantastic event. You know, we're talking today and through the next few days about the base of the future. And certainly that is a physical base. But as we think about this, there's also a base, a foundation to the future that we believe in AFWorks is a foundation of innovation. And how does that foundation happen? We believe that that foundation of innovation is this fusion. It's this melding of the multiple different communities that we have here uh, that this, this fantastic team has pulled together as we bring together some of our youngest airmen bringing in fresh new ideas, as we bring in some of the most entrepreneurial spirits out there in the non-traditional startup market, as we bring all of those folks together for a specific target and that target being the base of the future. So uh, deep appreciation to everyone who's put this together, this virtual conference. And as you know, originally the plan was not to have a virtual conference, our intent, was as we have done for the last several years with Fusion, bring everyone together physically. Obviously, as has happened in many cases, we've not had that opportunity this year. So what you're going to get this week is not your standard virtual conference. Bringing together military and private sector in a very interactive ways, in ways you've never seen before, to collaborate on these new topics, to collaborate on ways that we are getting to a partnership that is so important for the security of our nation. Over the course of the next three days, you're gonna be immersed in a journey looking at six different AFWORKS challenges, bringing together the best minds in order to see what that base of the future looks like. Each of those challenge, challenges started with a workshop. And so bringing those ideas together in a workshop, uh, from that workshop, identifying what the problems are, not looking at a standard rigid set of requirements, but looking what is in the realm of the possible. And this is, this is really key to this new approach that we are taking for AFWERKS, a new approach to capability of development that says, we're not necessarily going to go and, and, and fight the next war, right? The next war may not be a, a physical war, but the war that we fight daily in order to effectively turn the treasure of the taxpayer into capability to secure our nation. And as we do that, thinking about very non-traditional ways of doing that, thinking about ways that we will actually start to leverage those in, innovative minds that are out there and being able to look at a toolbox that's not just what are the requirements that we have internally, but start to leverage that research and development that happens across our entire American innovation ecosystem. And then posture ourselves to take smart risks, to take feedback from the end users, to prototype and find ways that maybe we can very effectively at a relatively low cost, get capability into our operators and do it in a way that we are competing with speed. Our airmen really cannot wait on the legacy acquisition processes. We can't rely on a status quo that is delivering the best capabilities offered by the last century. We have to continue upgrading. We have to continue bringing in ideas and sustaining these capabilities in ways that maybe we haven't been able to before, looking at things like advanced manufacturing, 3D printing, advanced analytics to help us understand what predictive maintenance might look like. As we look at a global power competition and looking at who we have on our team to participate in this competition, to make sure that the ideas of a free and open society are those ideas that will compete, those ideas that are protected, those are the people that are protected, we are taking a different approach. These six challenges that you're gonna learn about this week during this fusion experience is bringing those best minds together from the non-traditional solution providers, from a government end users and bringing them together in a way that fuses those ideas and, and turns a cycle time that in the past may have taken many years, many decades. You'll see examples where we are able to turn capability in the course of several months. Cutting through red tape, stopping the check the box thinking and increasing the speed and the agility so that our partners and our economic base, uh, both domestically and internationally, is prepared for this competition. We're gonna focus on base security and defense, installation resilience, but then tomorrow I'll dive into leveraging technology for operational effectiveness and reverse engineering. Looking at opportunities with additive manufacturing 
and being able to find, if you stick with this all the way through Thursday, an opportunity to get through all these things that eventually require a change in culture, empowering our airmen, and in particular, making sure that we have our families taken care of, looking at this idea of family well-being at our bases. So these, these are important, not just to the Air Force, uh, they're important across the entire Department of Defense. And we have got a group of innovators across our ecosystem that we are going to leverage to make sure that we are getting those greatest ideas into the hands of our airmen and finding ways of doing that in a timely manner. So I wanna thank everyone uh, for the opportunity. There's a fantastic lineup that we have here. Uh, you're gonna have opportunities to begin to collaborate in ways that you may not have expected before. A lot of people think of an online event and think that you know, you're just set and watch TV for the next few days. Uh, I assure you, take the opportunities uh, to do the networking that is there and making sure that you are able over the course of this week to challenge some of your ideas. Uh, if there is an individual who certainly knows how to challenge ideas, who knows how to challenge the status quo, and who wakes up every morning as one of America's greatest innovators, uh, you will not find someone more capable than Will Roper to do that. Uh, Dr. Roper, a Rhodes Scholar uh, and the founder of the Strategic Capabilities Office, is actually here joining us this morning uh, for those on the West Coast and early afternoon for those of us here on the East Coast uh, to kick off this fusion event. Dr. Roper, thanks for being here with us and thanks for taking the opportunity to kick off this fantastic event that we have lined up for the week. Over to you, sir. Hey. Colonel Diller, uh, I guess good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you're located. Uh, can you uh, can you hear me okay? I know we're using IT to allow people to collaborate and fuse virtually, which is really exciting. But let me get a comm check, and then we'll talk about what's exciting about this event AppWorks is putting on. And I'm hearing you loud and clear. Sounds like it's good across. Awesome. Well, first and foremost, uh, Colonel Diller, congratulations on uh, being the director of AFWorks in its 2.0 phase. And for the entire AFWorks nation that's tuning in, uh, whether you're an airman, whether you're a contractor, whether you're a company that has worked with AFWorks perennially, or whether you're a new company coming to an event for the first time thinking, I've heard the Air Force has an interesting way for commercial innovators to collaborate and work on new and exciting problems. Welcome. I am so excited by what this organization has accomplished and what it will continue accomplishing as we plug it in as not as not an experiment with within our acquisition enterprise, but as part and parcel of how we do business across the board. So for anyone involved who has been part of this in the past, or maybe part of this is in the future, I am so excited uh, by what has been accomplished and what will be. Bottom line, AFWorks is really about thinking of commercial innovation itself as a battlefield that the military has to treat seriously. We just can't sit behind fence lines or here in the Pentagon where I'm joining you from today and think that the world's best ideas and technology are simply going to jump into our future warfighting systems just because we want them to. Now that Cold War model where the military funded most of the research and development in this nation, that's over, you all know that. But the Pentagon is still sleeping uh, like Rip Van Winkle in those older times and its dream of being the center of R&D is simply over. The Pentagon is 20% of what our nation does on a whole in research and development. And that's not because we've gotten any worse at it. We still have amazing technologies coming out of our labs, but we're working on things that can't be commercialized. And increasingly, technology is commercialized by, by thought, by inception, by intention. Its very birth is targeting commercial users. And that's what's new and amazing about the world today. It's that technology is cheap and ubiquitous and so many people can be involved in this amazing tech ecosystem. And back in that Cold War era, you simply couldn't be. Technology was quite expensive to create in an era where computers were expensive and difficult, which is why nations and very large companies were the movers and shakers of that era, but not so anymore. And it's a, it's a better time to be alive. It's an exciting time to be alive. 
but it also means that we've got to have a reverent, a reverent trepidation about what will happen if we don't treat these technologies seriously, if we don't treat commercial innovation as a battlefield and make sure we're on the forefront. And battlefield really means competing. It means doing what we can in the military to compete in all areas of tech. And ways that we can help compete are by partnering with companies like you, partnering with operators who need new solutions to bring our funding, which we still have, right? That hasn't changed since the Cold War, but also the market that we represent, the fact that we purchase things in quantities, that we can tolerate a higher entry price point than the commercial market, that we can help bridge companies towards commercialization. And none of this, I can promise you, none of this talk that we're having today is going to be happening in any other Pentagon conference room. This is just such a new idea, but it is so self-evident uh, that we in the Air Force are not waiting on getting broader direction. We are moving out and AFWorks is leading the charge. Now, fusion events like this are exceptionally important because when we need to take on a new area of research, a new set of challenges, we need to be able to expose that to innovators of all types. And a challenge like Base of the Future is a fantastic way to bring together innovators who are thinking about very different fields of technology. If you're a perennial partner of the Air Force or Space Force, you know that we work in all fields of technology. In fact, if you're working on a breakthrough technology and we can't partner with you on a military use case, then shame on us because our portfolio is so much broader than aircraft and satellites and cyber tools that you may think of first when you think of the Air Force and Space Force. But we have medical, huge medical equities and energy and logistics and, and data itself is something that's increasingly important for how we do business. So companies of all type can have a huge and profound impact on how we do our mission. You can keep our men and women in uniform either safer, more efficient, more productive, or, or more future-proof as technologies change. All things that have a direct impact on our mission. Now, base of the future is a fantastic challenge for us to tee up because it's going to involve areas of technology from across the board. Now, what would a base of the future look like in an ideal world? Well, that's part of why you're here, is we want your thoughts. We want your imagination and your technology. But I'm happy to share some of my own, since uh, when I get a few uh, spare moments in the Pentagon to think, I do like to have my head in the clouds, much like Colonel Diller does virtually with his uh, very snazzy background. Uh, I'm trying to do my best with a mountaintop behind me, uh, Colonel Diller, a picture I took, took myself. Um, so I don't have to worry about any of the data rights on this, but uh, it is it is fun getting to think about the future when you work in a job where you can help make it make it come true. So so the, if you don't know a lot about the Air Force, a base is much more than a place where we have a bunch of buildings. You know, a base is the area from which we launch and project power. Whether that projection of power is war fighting or whether it is going out and conducting disaster relief, humanitarian assistance, the Air Force is first into the foray because airplanes are fast and we can fly from the U.S. To anywhere in the globe and put an aircraft there and sustain it. So first and foremost, if you're an adversary of the United States Air Force, the first thing you'd like to do, I would say the Space Force as well, because we project power as well from our Space Force bases. But the first thing you'd like to do is hold that base at risk. Well, how do you hold a base at risk? Well, there's so many different ways you might conceive of. In fact, get a team of evil geniuses together and they'll come up with 10 different ways before the hour is out as to how you could hold a base at risk. You could physically destroy it with weapons the way that a conventional military might think of. And we need ideas on how to be resilient, uh, able to operate through if we can't defend 100%, how do we make ourselves more resilient, more able to take a punch and keep fighting? But beyond conventional attack, you'll realize there are a lot of other things you could do. Maybe they're non-kinetic things that you could do. Destroy the power system, for instance, or, or just hold runways at risk, You know, crater them, put materials on them that make it difficult for us to fly airplanes. Because an air base you can't fly airplanes from is just simply going back 
to being a bunch of buildings behind a fence line. So think of all the different things that are on a base. We have our facilities, we have our personnel, we have our flight lines, we have our hangars, we have our spares for aircraft, we have our maintenance crews, we have our operators, all of whom have to work together in symbiosis to project the power that is the United States Air Force. Any one of those things put into disarray, you go from being an Air Force to just a bunch of airplanes. So help us think through how we act more resiliently, more adaptively, uh, without having single points of failure. So resilience, redundancy are things that we really value. And thinking very non-traditionally about how an adversary might try to hold this amazing service at risk uh, in a way that we haven't thought of, and then, then what do we do to fix it? Now, you can imagine that once we're able to keep a base operating through tough times induced by an adversary, the next thing we'd be thinking about is, is how to make that base operate in, in an environment in the future that is contested, not just from a threat standpoint, but from the point of view that it may be cut off from resupply and logistics that would flow out of the United States. We have air bases in the United States and space bases too, but we also have a lot of forward operating bases. And it's important that we be able to flow new systems in to keep them operating, to keep them supplied. Well, you could imagine why defeat the war fighting edge of the Air Force? Why defeat the fighters and bombers and in, in flight and on the Space Force side, the satellites in orbit, why defeat that if you can simply hold the logistics train that resupplies them at risk? So things we would value in the base of the future is the ability to operate more austerely, more autonomously. So are we waiting for that airplane part to come in so we can fix a plane on the ground? Or are we printing that part on site? Are we making things locally so we're not dependent on those supply chains? Are we able to reroute and do local logistics and maintenance at the edge? One of the reasons we're really excited about our flying car program, also run by AFWorks, Agility Prime, is the ability to do logistics at the edge that would traditionally require a very big airplane that just simply said is just not affordable or sustainable in austere environments. The runways itself that are needed to keep those planes operating at the ed edge are not affordable in a broadly disaggregated way. Flying cars may change that. So changing the calculus for what we can do at the edge, whether being able to do more locally, being more autonomous or being more resilient. So if you're a company with ideas about energy, better energy efficiency, energy production at the edge, yes, we have to have power. And if our adversary cuts that off, then it's the same as defeating our airplanes in flight. So resilience and autonomy at the edge are things that, that we also really value. I also think that our bases of the future, we've got to be able to put a base in a box and take it with us. No, not the entire base. We're certainly not going to package up a runway and fold it out uh, the way Inspector Gadget could, if you know those, those old cartoons. But, but a lot of what we'll need to do on future bases will need to be palletized in a way that we can take it forward. As we do more data fusion and data-centric decision-making at our base, those data hubs, those big brains that are processing through the myriad logistics calculations and operational calculations that are needed for effective uh, war fighting or, or effective disaster relief, those are things that can be held at risk, their vulnerability. And so I think we're going to need to be able to, to take components of the base out to the edge, being able to push the boundaries of what austere operations, remote operations, or edge operations mean. Now, we all know this uh, as, we, as we come from home into our work environments or just simply leave our houses and go out into the world around us, although that's certainly not as frequent under COVID-19, that our mobile devices, um, they, go with us low, they go with us to the edge but when we come home, they connect to the broader infrastructure that are our home networks and then the internet itself. So they're powerful at the edge. They're even more powerful as they connect to more devices. And I think our bases are gonna to need to feel like that. I think airplanes as they go forward will need to have a certain level of sophistication and processing and compute. 
But when they come home and land, they re-plug in to the broader cloud, the broader network that our Air Force is building but needs to build faster. And that that tops them up with the latest information and latest data so that the next sortie that they fly, they're, they're more able, they're more able to fight with data as their leading edge. I think this idea of being a data centric service is one I see in the makings, but it's a big pivot for us because every military currently defines itself by its platforms, the things that you can take pictures of. So airplanes and satellites and outside of the Air Force and Space Force, you know, ships and tanks and those things that are photographable, but data isn't and cloud isn't. And data architectures are even more obscure. And so if we have to value these as much as we value our really snazzy fighter jets today, what a wonderful place to bring them in, to bake them into the very foundational concept of what a base is, of being a data centric, uh, a data centric entity. And that though there are physical components of it, the data architecture and the decisions it allows us to make are even more important. So if you're an AI company, base of the future should be your home. There are so many different opportunities to help us churn logistics, op tempo, maintenance, resupply, bringing the power of prediction that machine learning has and putting it to bear on practical problems for the military, both in peacetime and in conflict. Also, if you are a comms company, Anyone hoping to push the boundary of 5G communications, we're already there. We already have bases of the future now in terms of Air Force bases that have opened the door to 5G manufacturers so that they can start testing their gear using Air Force uh, men and women as the, the guinea pigs and guinea pigs that are actually really excited about participating in the experiment. So a base of the future has a wonderful opportunity to push the boundaries of 5G, start experimenting with Internet of Things 2.0, where increasingly more things at the edge, more things that are the T's in the IoT are going to be things that move in the physical world where there will be safety implications. So think drones, self-driving vehicles, all of which could make a base of the future much more efficient, much more able to operate autonomously if we can keep the communications up. So a huge opportunity to participate if you're one of those companies. Here's the rub though, is that at our base of the future, an adversary that sees all of that empowerment from communication and data-centric decision-making, well, that's gonna be the first thing they wanna take out. So how do we make it more ruggedized, more able to operate through tough conditions? And if we're able to solve that problem together, that's not just a military problem. That's the same thing in a disaster zone, a hurricane, a tsunami. How do we keep critical comms working so that when it's a very bad day from a disaster point of view, that first responders and medical relief and logisticians that have to rebuild infrastructure are not cut off from communicating with what they see on the ground and that people in need are able to communicate as well, most importantly. So austere, ruggedized communication can be much broader than just the military. But it's a great example of a market that can probably happen if the military throws in its weight first. Help catalyze it for our mission that we need today, and then help spin it out into the commercial market that would hopefully find it easier to embrace because it's been de-risked because of our time, our funding, and, and our mission application. We need to repeat that motto using our military market to de-risk new technology options and spin them out towards faster commercialization. We need that motto again and again across numerous programs. That is how we actually compete on the innovation battlefield. We can't win in the military alone. In fact, we can't even begin winning as only 20% of our nation's RMD. But if we view our value proposition, the uniqueness factor we bring to bear and bake it into challenges like we're doing in the AFWERX Fusion event uh, this, today and this week, then we'll increasingly open up our aperture and hopefully the apertures of commercial innovators and entrepreneurs to think of us as a bridge market, to think of us as a catalyst. And we have to do our utmost to continue to earn the trust that's been given to us over the past couple of years. 
I was just speaking with a, a former senior official in another service, just saying, I can't believe how fast the Air Force is moving in this tech domain, this commercial innovation domain. And I'm asking my own service to really move out on this because I see the future in what's being trailblazed. Well, I see the future too. And I feel the urgency of ensuring that our military today and future is connected to the entire innovation base that our nation has. It is our national strength and treasure. It is awesome to live in a time of such amazing tech. And I'm excited to see what companies and innovators everywhere dream up about how the base of the future should be.